My dear friends, we are going on periscope depth again, and my guest doesn't need any introduction to any audience. Anyway, I uh, love saying that. Uh, United States Marine Corps Major and uh, former UN Weapons Inspector Scott Ritter is my guest again. Scott, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Well, lots of questions uh, for today, and uh, I picked the most hot of them. President Biden uh, approves cluster munition uh, for Ukraine. Uh, the type of munition which is uh, banned in most of uh, NATO allied countries. Please correct me if I'm wrong. So please tell us about this munitions uh, failure rate, what it means for uh, the uh, areas uh, in long perspective, the areas uh, in which they may be used, and uh, what is coming out of uh, this uh, Biden's decision. What do you see in it? Well, first of all, let's just get down to the legalities. Um, these are not illegal weapons at all. There is a uh, convention um, it, that, that seeks to ban these weapons. Uh, the United States is not a signatory to this convention, nor is Russia, nor is Ukraine. So let's just get straight to the bones here. Um, there's nothing illegal about the use of these weapons. Um, two. Does this represent an escalation of the conflict? In theory, yes, but in practicality, no. Uh, this is ammunition. Ammunition, uh, the technology of which dates back to 1987, uh, back when I was in the Marine Corps, back when I was in Marine Corps artillery. Uh, DPICM, Dual Purpose Improved Conventional Munitions, has always been a, um, a, a firepower option for uh, people in the artillery. Um, you know, ideally, it um, it allows you to saturate a given area with um, smaller cluster munitions, increasing the probability of kill uh, for people that are in the impact zone. This is war. The job of people in war is to kill people. Um, I don't mean to be too callous here, but, uh, you know, while I believe that Russia had every right to uh, to initiate the special military operation, well, I believe that Russia is on the right side of history. Um, let's just, this wasn't a game that Russia entered into. When Russia chose to choose the military technical option, uh, they chose to go to war. Whether they call it war, they call it a special military operation is a, is a matter of semantics. But it's, it's, a, it's an endeavor where Russia seeks to achieve military dominance. And you do that by killing more of the enemy than they kill of you. Um, Russia employs uh, weaponry that many people in the West view as um, inhumane. Um, the TOS-1 and TOS-2 uh, barometric uh, munitions, the flame flower weapons that Russia uh, uses are horrific, horrific weapons. They, they, they kill um, numerous Ukrainians. Uh, and, the, and, you know, the, the, the Russians um, use 500 kilogram uh, you know, guided munitions, uh, bombs, planed bombs uh, that, that are devastating to the Ukrainians. Uh, and the Ukraine has every right under the laws of conflict to, uh, to defend itself. Again, I'm not on the side of Ukraine. I don't believe that Ukraine is right. But they have the right to defend themselves. And they have the right to defend themselves using um, the means that can be made available to it. Um, the uh, the 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 DPICM uh, artillery shell uh, that uh, I think it's the M864 um, is is a weapon being made available to Ukraine. Are Russians going to die because of this weapons? Absolutely. Uh, will it increase the number of Russian dead? Probably not. I don't think this weapon will have a meaningful impact on the overall course of uh, of the war. Um, first of all, it has to be employed from a 155 millimeter artillery system. Uh, and Russia is in the business of killing these systems as we speak. The M777, um, you know, U.S. Uh, howitzer uh, is being hunted down and destroyed by the Lancet uh, loitering munitions. So are the German self-propelled artillery uh, systems, the M109s, the M109 derivatives, the French Caesar, 
the life expectancy of a Ukrainian 155 millimeter artillery system on the battlefield uh, has to be measured in days, uh, weeks at the most. Um, they're losing these systems faster than they can be replenished. Uh, the other thing is, as these artillery shells come in, um, they, they will use a um, logistical um, supply route that Russia is tracking. Uh, the, the shells have to enter into Ukraine and then be taken to the front lines. Um, my guess is that uh, the majority of these shells will be destroyed by Russian um, uh, you know, air power, uh, striking warehouses, intermediate storage facilities, etc., and never be used. And uh, the other shells will be allocated will be allocated to uh, weapon systems. No problem. It happens to me all the time. Uh, we allocated to uh, artillery systems that will be destroyed before they get to fire these weapons. So uh, this is a this is a political um, gambit. Look, the president of the United States has to be seen as doing something. Uh, the United States, like NATO, is being confronted with the reality that Russia is winning on the battlefield, that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is not succeeding. And to do nothing is to concede to the inevitability of that outcome. And so the president of the United States um, is making a political decision. Um, when you take a look at the weapon systems that were available to him in terms of consideration, uh, DPICM is the, is the least harmful to Russia. Um, you know, the president could have authorized the release of the Attackums missile. He could have authorized the release of F-16 fighters, um, but he didn't. He chose DPICM. Uh, the media will go crazy over the concept of cluster munitions. People will get distracted by uh, the, uh, the convention that bans these without understanding that, legally speaking, they aren't banned uh, in Ukraine. Uh, all three parties to this conflict, um, the United States, Russia, NATO, or, or Ukraine, and I am saying the United States is a party to this conflict. There's no doubt about that. Um, they're not signatories to this convention, so let's just stop the nonsense of talking about the cruelty and the illegality of these weapons. No, you know, war is cruel. Every weapon is cruel. When a 5.45 millimeter round hits a body, it's cruel. Same thing when a 7.62 hits a body. Um, and yet nobody complains when rifle shots are fired. Um, these, these are weapons that are designed to kill people, as all weapons are. And if they're employed, they will kill people. They'll probably destroy some equipment. That's war. That's the price you pay when you enter into a conflict. But it is not a game-changing technology. Um, again, Russia has this conflict under control. What I mean by that is that Russia is controlling the pace um, and the outcome of this conflict. And American provision of DPICM artillery munitions to Ukraine is not going to do anything to alter that. That's fascinating. And um, speaking of uh, Ukrainian failure of uh, counter-offensive, uh, another, uh, another thing is coming out. A Russian ambassador for the U.S. Uh, said the Ukrainians are seeking for a pretext for um, some case which would uh, cause uh, the NATO to intervene and uh, enter Ukraine. And that's uh, pretty uh, well, pretty serious to a Russian audience because uh, a Russian ambassador for the U.S. Um, well, usually doesn't blow in smoke. What do you think about that? I think that uh, NATO is convening a summit in Vilnius, uh, Lithuania, on um, July 11th. The summit will run from the 11th to the 12th. There'll be uh, preliminary meetings, there'll be meetings afterwards. Um, and one of the big problems that NATO will be confronting is what to do about the deteriorating situation in Ukraine. Um, already we, we've seen that the uh, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg um, has previously articulated this conflict as, as a being of an existential nature, not only for Ukraine, but for NATO. NATO can't lose, he says. Now, it's interesting, because he says NATO can't lose. Russia says Russia can't lose. Somebody's going to lose. And somebody's losing right now, and that somebody is NATO. NATO backed Ukraine, and it's failing. The, the, their, their bet it's like being at the casino and you put all your money on red and the ball hits black on the roulette table and you watch as the 
uh, dealer takes away your chips and NATO's watching all the chips they put on the table betting on Ukraine being taken away by Russia. Um, so there's a lot of dialogue taking place in the lead up to this summit about what can NATO do to reverse this outcome. You have a former Secretary General, uh, Rasmussen, um, saying that while it might be impossible for NATO as an organization to intervene, um, there, there's a possibility that NATO members could come together in a coalition of the willing outside of NATO to come to the assistance of Ukraine. And so there are people talking about this. Uh, Poland uh, is in active discussions with uh, the Ukrainian government about creating some sort of union that would, um, you, you know, marry Poland with Ukraine, with Western Ukraine, perhaps, um, in an effort maybe to extend NATO Article 5 protections into this new territory, although that legally can't happen and won't happen. Um, but if I'm the Russian ambassador to the United States and I'm watching as the United States prepares for this summit and as the United States remains silent about um, all of this discussion about you know, what NATO can do to reverse the course of this conflict, I would be concerned about that and I would give voice to this. Sometimes by articulating your concerns, um, you communicate to the other parties that you're aware of what they're doing. Um, and you hope that they will reflect on the consequences of what they seek to do and maybe stop doing it. So I think the, the Russian ambassador's um, statements are a form of deterrence to, to let NATO and the United States know that Russia is aware of what they are planning and they're not going to get away with it. And uh, he also mentioned that a uh, case like this uh, I mean, uh, Ukraine might use as a case like this uh, another provocation at the uh, uh, Zaporizhia nuclear plant. So, you know, they have blown up, uh, up the, the dam and uh, they might blow up the uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear plant. So, uh, how likely, to your opinion, provocation like this, or maybe uh, the masters of Ukraine may, maybe will talk some reason to Zelensky and his generals, or uh, on the contrary, they may use such provocation as an Article 4 or Article 5 case. You know, this isn't the first time we've had this discussion. If you recall, in the uh, early summer of 2022, um, Ukraine accused uh, Russia of, A, positioning military assets at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, and B, shelling the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, that Russia shelled its own positions. Mm -hmm. um, and this prompted a, um, an emergency intervention by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which dispatched a team to Zaporizhia to... Um, to see what was happening. The goal at that time for Ukraine was to create an, a, a, a sense of, um, of a regional and global nuclear crisis of such a scope and scale that the international community would feel compelled to intervene, to take control of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and the territory around it, uh, to remove the Russians from this plant. Uh, and that was the goal, that was the objective. It failed. Uh, Russia's not yielding. Um, and today it's even more difficult because at that time, um, Zaporizhia was occupied Ukrainian territory. Today, Zaporizhia is Russia. Now, I know there's many in the West who disagree with that, but from the Russian perspective, constitutionally, it's Russia. So the notion of yielding Russian territory to an international force is absurd in the extreme. It's a non-starter. isn't going to happen. But the Ukrainians are playing political games. Uh, they're, they're trying to get the world to, to, to go down this path. The, uh, the reality is, and, and remember, when you, when you listen to what the Russians are saying about using a, a Tochko-U um, uh, you know, radio, uh, radiological warhead, a dirty bomb on top of a missile, the Russians uh, had similar intelligence about uh, a similar event that was supposed to take place over Chernobyl. Um, a while back. So this is recycled intelligence, whether 
uh, Russia is collecting it anew or repurposing it for this. Uh, what the Russians are doing, again, is raising awareness, um, letting NATO and Ukraine and everybody know that they're aware of uh, Ukrainian rhetoric in this regard and um, that there would be consequences for this. I don't know if the Ukrainians ever would have pulled the trigger on their plan. I think this plan existed mainly as a way of intimidating the world into action uh, because it would be suicidal for Ukraine to do something like this. Even the world, the, the Western world, uh, could not rally around Ukraine's support should they initiate an attack on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant that results in a nuclear catastrophe. Uh, forensically, it would be apparent who, who was responsible and Ukraine would lose a lot of support. So I don't think Ukraine was ever going to do this. Um, but I think Russia's goal in speaking out about this was to get the West to turn to Ukraine and just say, stop it, stop the, stop the rhetoric. You know, this attack was supposed to take place on July 5th, and it's July 7th. So didn't happen. I don't think it ever will happen. I think it was one of these uh, gambits uh, played by Ukraine to try and shape the uh, perception of the of the NATO alliance uh, for the need to intervene. That's what Ukraine wants, the necessity of intervention. Um, and they use the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant as a scheme to get NATO to start considering uh, under what circumstances intervention could take place. This is designed to influence the um, you know, the schedule of work at the Vilnius summit, nothing more. I don't think this was ever a real threat to attack the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Great. That's uh, pretty reassuring. Well, uh, it's been uh, already a month since uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensive officially started. So uh, nothing really effectively happened. Ukraine didn't gain anything. How do you see the process? Are there chances for Ukraine to uh, well, advance, to have some success? Uh, maybe you know something about, maybe uh, they plan something or they have a lot of resources to continue trying to uh, advance? Well, I'll let General Zeluzhny answer this question for me um, so that I'm not accused of having an anti-Ukrainian bias. Um, he's straight up said that doctrinally um, NATO forces would never launch an attack uh, against a fortified defensive position um, without having effective air cover without having artillery supremacy. He says that Ukraine has no air cover, that the Russians outgunned Ukraine 10 to 1. And he says there's no chance of this counterattack ever succeeding. That's General Zeluzhny. He's the top dog in uh, the Ukrainian military. Um, I've written articles. Uh, I published one in uh, Russia Today um, that basically call what's happening in Ukraine um, uh, an act of criminality on the part of NATO because NATO knows its doctrine. It knows doctrinally what needs to occur to achieve the breach of a fortified position. Um, there's, uh, there's a little mnemonic that they use, uh, an acronym, um, SORA, SORNA, something of that nature. I don't care what happens. The first S is the only one that matters, which is suppression. Uh, because under U.S. Army doctrine and NATO doctrine, if you don't achieve effective suppression of the enemy that's dug in, nothing else matters. <laughs> you can't talk about anything else. Um, suppression requires uh, the ability to keep the enemy air power out of the air. That means you have to have aircraft that can push them away. You need to protect the airspace where your soldiers are going to be operating. That means you need effective air defense. You need to jam the communications of the, of the enemy so that they can't coordinate a response. And you need to effectively counter their artillery with your own artillery. Uh, your artillery has to suppress their troops and suppress their artillery. Uh, that is suppression. Um, Ukraine can do none of that. Ukraine has zero ability to suppress any aspect of Russia's defense on the battlefield. Um, 
Therefore, it was preordained that this uh, attack was going to fail. Now, you would ask yourself, why would Ukraine go into that? Well, we have assessments coming out of NATO and the United States Army um, that are that are very callous. They, they acknowledge Ukraine has zero regard for human life, zero regard for casualties, none whatsoever. Um, and if you recall what General Lloyd Austin uh, said back in May of 2022, the purpose of the support of Ukraine was to inflict sufficient pain on Russia so that Russia would never again consider in entering into um, an operation of this sort. Vladimir Putin bragged, uh, rightly so, early on in the counteroffensive, um, in the pre prigozhin days, um, that you know Russia had killed 13,000 Ukrainian soldiers in the first couple weeks of this offensive. He said, we have a 10 to 1 kill ratio. Now, that's an amazing kill ratio until you think of the following. If you killed 13,000 Ukrainians, how many Russians died? 1,300. That's a huge number. People need to wrap their head around that number. That's a giant number. Today, they're talking about 20,000 Ukrainians having been killed to date by this offensive. That's 2,000 dead Russians. Now, that's if Russia was able to sustain a 10 to 1 kill ratio. But as the Ukrainians improve uh, their, you know, the, every, every military, no matter what, when they first initiate combat, there's, you've got to shake off the rust, you've got to do this. But as Ukraine improves, as they adapt to what Russia is doing, one has to assume that that kill ratio is being reduced. It's still going to be ridiculously high, 6 to 1, 7 to 1. But what it means is that the Russian casualties are actually pain that Lloyd Austin is talking about. This is what um, Ukraine seeks to do. They seek to inflict so much pain on Russia so that the Russian people lose heart, that the Russian people stop supporting this conflict. Because the Russian people really aren't reflecting on the 20,000 dead Ukrainians. That's the job of the Ukrainian population, which apparently has little regard for human life. The Russian people are solely concerned with the 2,000 bodies coming home in zinc line boxes. That's what they're concerned about. Uh, and they have to ask themselves the questions, is, the, is this loss worth what we're trying to accomplish? What are we trying to accomplish? What is the goal and objective here? Can we accomplish it? Um, and these are questions that the West wants the Russians to ask. They want them to search for answers, and they want them to be dissatisfied with the answers that they're receiving so that they lose the will to fight. That's what's happening here. This is an extension of what George Soros originally wrote of in 1993 in an article that touched on the future of NATO. He said, what is the future of NATO in a post-Cold War environment? He said, we will, of course, have to focus on Russia because we need an enemy worthy of the defense expenditures. But he said, we can't talk about fighting the Russians because that will produce heavy NATO casualties, which the populations of Europe are not prepared to absorb. So what NATO needs to do is seek an accommodation with Eastern Europe, not to make them NATO members, but to make them attracted to NATO so that a situation arises where Eastern European manpower can be married up with NATO technology for the purpose of inflicting pain on Russia. 1993, he wrote this. And the reason why you want that is that you don't want NATO body bags coming home. NATO body bags are bad. The implication is that Eastern European body bags are okay. And that's where we're at today. It's not just that the Ukrainian government has shown a horrific indifference to the loss of life of its own people, but NATO, an organization that claims to be intervening on behalf of the Ukrainians, are indifferent to the casualties of the Ukrainian army. Let them fight to the last Ukrainian, is what Lindsey Graham, an American senator, has infamously said. And there's no one in the West right now uh, lamenting the fact that an entire generation of Ukrainian manpower has been eliminated, has been lost because of this war. Because NATO buys into this Soros, um, you know, thematic of marrying Western technology to Eastern European manpower 
for the purpose of inflicting pain on Russia while producing as few as possible NATO body bags. That's what's so that's what's happening here. That's what's going on right now. Um, and so Russia's in a race. Um, will Ukraine run out of manpower before Russia runs out of the will to fight? Um, I just came back from Russia, and I have to say that um, the Russia that I saw was not indifferent to the losses that are being suffered. Uh, these weren't the people that were like, yeah, that's nothing, no big deal. Uh, the Russian people I met were very concerned about the loss of life at the front line, <laughs> Russian and Ukrainian, by the way. Um, but there are also people, and I was there, as you know, um, around the time of uh, Victory Day. And um, the one takeaway that I had from Victory Day wasn't that it was a propaganda-driven celebration of the moment. We just had the 4th of July here in the United States celebration of the birth of america um today nobody's celebrating the fourth of july it's over it's finished no one's reflecting on the birth of the nation and i will tell you on the fourth of july nobody was reflecting on the birth of the nation they were reflecting on fireworks they're reflecting on picnics they're reflecting on you know family gatherings but the last thing they were reflecting on is why are we here what is this about but in russia everybody reflected on what is victory day what is this about and it's not just a, a recognition of the defeat of Nazi Germany, but it has a modern relevance because of the resurrection of Banderist ideology in Ukraine, which is directly linked to the same Nazi ideology that Russia, together with the United States and other allies, destroyed, came together to destroy. And so every Russian I met, and I'll just say this too, my, um, my wife's father is Georgian, uh, passed away uh, a couple years ago, and he left behind a handwritten um, memoir, which we're in the process of, we're going to publish it in honor of him. Uh, fascinating memoir. But when he talks about our, her family uh, during the Second World War, a fact came out that she wasn't aware of, that the Khatyashvili family lost five members in World War II. Now, many of these people were people she would never have known of because they died at the age of 18, 19, 20. They died in places like Poland, Germany, Czechoslovakia. Um, their bodies never were returned home. Uh, their bodies are forever either, I think the Polish bodies in a mass grave. They think that his bodies in a mass grave in Poland where uh, the Russian bodies or the Soviet bodies were buried. But the Khatyashvili family lost five people in that war. And I think that Every Russian family, every Soviet family can say we lost people in that war. Mine also. And unlike America, yeah, unlike America, which has forgotten who we are and what we are, we have a celebration for the birth of our nation, but we're not celebrating the birth of our nation. We're just getting drunk. We're just eating hot dogs. We're just watching fireworks. Um, the Russians on Victory Day were celebrating Russia. We're celebrating the Soviet Union. And we're saying... We will never forget the sacrifice the 27 million made, and we will never dishonor this sacrifice. Um, and so there was, you know, I emerged from this. And, and remember, this, this is something, this was both in the lead up to Victory Day and in the aftermath of Victory Day. Even though Victory Day ended, people were still wearing the St. George's um, ribbons. People were still talking about this. People were reflecting on it. People went to visit the monuments, went to lay flowers, and it never ends. It never ends. Um, and so I think that this is a very healthy place for Russia to be. It's healthy to not forget the sacrifice that was made by others before you to allow you to be here as you are today. But it's also very important not to minimize the sacrifice that's going on today um, in continuation of that struggle in Ukraine. Russians should mourn the loss of every Russian life in Ukraine and every Ukrainian life as well. War is hell, war is horrible. They should mourn it. Russians should be adamant to their government that it must win this conflict that it, it cannot disgrace uh, the memory of those who've gone before. Um, 
but Russia will never break, in my opinion. I just don't see it. I, I think in the West, sometimes we misconstrue sorrow for weakness. We misconstrue the fact that Russians are crying about the dead, that that means that they um, believe they should stop this fighting. And I think it's just the opposite. They weep for the dead because they know more must die because victory must be attained. Uh, and that the Russians, while they are not willing to throw away lives, um, there is no disregard for human life in Russia. Even the Ukrainians and the Americans acknowledge that the Russians care more about their soldiers than the West does. Um, but this is not a sign of weakness. And I think that's what's important to point out, is that uh, Russia's humanity is not a sign of weakness. It's a, it's a sign of strength. And the resilience of Russia is, is, is real. And I think that this has to be factored in when we talk about this conflict. Russians have never put a timetable on Scott, I'm sorry, you when just... the last time the Russian government said... You just fell out. Like, okay. You just fell out. Uh, Am I back? Yeah, right now you're back. Okay. <laughs> I, I think the CIA might have been listening to us and decided to scramble the signal. <laughs> but uh, yeah. the, uh, no, my, my, my point is that the, you know, the Russians have never put a timetable on victory. They haven't said, we must win by this date. NATO and Ukraine, on the other hand, are always putting timetables out there. We must achieve a result by this date. We must do something like this. And those time, timelines are never met. And so it's NATO and Ukraine that are stumbling forward with a calendar-driven agenda, which will, will, will never be fulfilled. And Russia is saying, we simply must accomplish the mission. And I believe that Russia will accomplish the mission. Um, when that will happen... It's hard to say. I continue to be optimistic that Russia has the ability to militarily defeat Ukraine by the end of summer, early fall of this year. But there needs to be a political resolution to this, uh, to this war as well. Um, demilitarization was just one aspect. Denazification is a political problem. And how Russia achieves denazification, how they're going to quantify that, how they seek to accomplish that has yet to be defined by the Russian government, at least publicly. Maybe they have their own papers. Uh, you know, they're, I'm sure they've done internal discussions about this. But I think the, the Russians, I think a lot of people focus on the military aspect of this conflict and, and say, well, Russia's going to win, therefore Russia will dictate the terms. I'm guilty of that often. I'm guilty of saying that this will be a Missouri-type solution, meaning the USS battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay, where we forced the Japanese to come on board and sign articles of surrender that they had no say in whatsoever. And, you know, this is my American prejudice coming in and imprinting a solution on. But, as I said, traveling to Russia, I learned a lot. Um, it caused me to think a lot. And um, in, in seeing President Putin explain to the uh, African delegation that came to uh, St. Petersburg to implore him to... Um, to seek a negotiated end to this when he held up the documents and he said, that's all we've ever done. Here I have a signed treaty. We could have ended this war. There were 18 articles outlining, uh, you know, the security concerns of Ukraine, guarantees, etc. cetera. Uh, we withdrew our troops from Kiev and Sumy and elsewhere as a sign of good faith. And we were betrayed by the Ukrainians. Um, Russia has always sought a negotiated settlement. And I think one of the reasons why the Russians might be silent on a political uh, conclusion to this conflict is that they don't want to tie themselves to a preordained um, outcome and thereby deny themselves for a negotiated solution that otherwise might make itself available. I think it's clear Russia will never give up the territories of Russia, Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Lugansk, Crimea. These are Russia forever. But after that, I think, um, again, we come back to what I talked about earlier. The Russians have a deep regard for human life, especially the lives of their soldiers. And anything that can be done to bring this war to an end uh, and save, preserve these lives, uh, as long as the national security interests of Russia are respected, I think would be a, an outcome the Russian government would, uh, would pursue. Um, for those who say, well, we're winning, 
you know, we need to see this through to the end, understand what you're saying. When you say, let's kill another 20,000 Ukrainian soldiers, you're saying, let's sacrifice another 2,000 Russian lives, 3,000 Russian lives. When you say, let's kill another 50,000 Ukrainian soldiers, you're saying, let's kill another five to 7,000 Russian lives. And the Russia I met means that those lives are linked to mothers, to wives, to children, to friends, relatives, colleagues. You're tearing the heart out of Russia and burying it in the soil of, the soil of Ukraine or the soil of Nova Russia. Um, and I think uh, any Russian government that uh, seeks to avoid that outcome um, should be applauded, not condemned. There's a lot of people now that are very angry at the Russian government for not bringing this war to conclusion. We saw that anger manifest itself in the Prigozhin mutiny. Um, and people continue to articulate support for Wagner and the theory of um, uh, there's an there's a easy way to win this war. There is no easy way to win this war. The war can only be won, one meter at a time, each meter soaked in the blood of Russians and Ukrainians. So anybody who articulates for the continuation of this conflict, understand what you're saying. You're condemning thousands of Russian soldiers to die. Now, if it's in a cause worthy of the sacrifice, so be it. But if once Russia's legitimate national security concerns are secured, uh, anything that can be done to bring this conflict to an end uh, responsibly should be pursued because it means that a father will be going home to his children, a husband will be going home to his wife, a son will be going home to his parents. And that's pretty cool. Gosh. Uh, in Moscow, I just recently went to see my father. I uh, met a young man. He was just uh, visiting, was going to visit his, his family. And uh, he told me that uh, he was not mobilized. He, was, uh, he went there as a volunteer. And he knew there will be problems on the, I mean, in, in the army. He knew what Russian army is. It's absolutely not perfect, like any other army in the world, which is maybe more or less perfect or unperfect. And he said when he got there, there were a lot of problems. The Ukrainians, which uh, keep going, keep dying, in huge numbers, as Russian soldiers also. But still, he was motivated to visit his family, come back, and continue fighting. Knowing exactly that now we are talking just in a marvelous city around us, and in a few weeks he's back there, he's back in hell, and nobody knows if he go, comes back well, in the sink casket or alive or mutilated or something else. And still he was motivated to go back and continue fighting for the country. And when I still trying to, to figure out how long these spastic moves of Ukraine are going to keep on, well, <laughs> I don't know. I'm getting horrified because are they going to eliminate the whole population of Ukraine, including children and women, throwing them to the front lines? Where do they get people? I don't know. This is just crazy. And, well, I'll, I'd rather stop talking about it because something coming on me. I just wanted, <coughs> I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask. Let me, let me, let me just say something for your audience real quick here. Um, because you brought it up, problems in the Russian military. And you said, well, that's because it's the Russian military has problems. You know, there's problems in every military. <laughs> every military has problems. Let's not talk about the Ukrainian military, which is I mean, because they don't care about their people. Let's talk about the American military. Um, you know, we're supposed to be perfect because we're the Americans. We have all the money in the world. We invest. Um, I will tell you, during the Gulf War, um, 
a, uh, a Delta squadron was a, a, a patrol, half squadron, a Delta force, the best soldiers in, in um, they were, they were compelled to, um, uh, retreat to a safe zone because they, um, they stripped their crypt, crypto, their, 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 their cryptology for their radios so they couldn't communicate. Uh, they screwed up. They made a mistake. So there wasn't any crypto available. These are the best soldiers in the world, and they screwed up in the middle behind enemy lines and had to be taken out of the battle because of that. Um, so, gosh, that's sort of a big deal. Um, I can tell you that... Um, you know, Marine units, uh, you know, ran out of ammunition because uh, convoys got lost. I can tell you that Army units ran out of gas because the gas tankers went the wrong way or somebody forgot to file the paperwork and they're still sitting in the rear area. I can tell you that in the in, when we invaded Iraq, people went into Iraq with unarmored vehicles because we didn't have enough because we weren't buying enough. And they had to make killabilly armor to go out and get things and, and weld armor plates onto the doors to stop bullets from coming in, which increased the weight of the vehicle, which caused the vehicles to break down at a higher rate, which then caused um, maintenance to try and catch up, but we didn't have enough maintenance, so we're towing vehicles behind. Now, you could imagine if I took a photograph of a Russian uh, tank towing a Russian truck in, 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 in the theater, and everybody go, that's the Russian army. Take a look at the Marine Corps advance on Baghdad and how... 50% of our armored fighting vehicles are being towed because they were broken down. We didn't have spare parts. We had to move on. War is hell. War is confusing. No military is perfect. Um, so just keep that in mind when the next time somebody badmouths the Russian army. Are there places Russia can improve? Oh, yeah. And the Russian soldiers are right to complain. All soldiers complain. Russian officers have to do a better job of listening. And the Russian staff has to do a better job of responding. Um, all Russia has to do a better job. You can't talk about taking the best of your country, these men who volunteer, these men who serve, they go into harm's way. You have to do everything you can to give them that which they need to succeed. Um, and so everybody should be demanding the best. But let's be realistic. In war, there's no such thing as the best. War is about survival. War is about, you know, trying to do what you can with what you have, not what you want. Um, so I just think people need to start being more realistic. That doesn't mean being tolerant. It's just being, just be more realistic about the, the life on the front lines. It's, it's uh, you're, you're operating in total chaos, total anarchy, total lawlessness, uh, without sleep, without food, you're hungry. Um, I could get even, you know... <laughs> We could continue down this path, but I just think that um, the critics of the Russian military operation just have to start being a little bit more realistic and a little bit more responsible about their criticism. No, thank you so much for that. Thank you. I think it's very important, especially coming from you, for Russians to hear, because sometimes, sometimes people who are too far from, well, from knowledge, what army is, what war is, they are falling into factions. So, and uh, people are listening to you, and uh, they keep telling me, writing me that it's very sobering up listening to you, Major. So, thank you for that. Thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to ask the last question because we are running out of time. Uh, may I ask to, well, just a few minutes, well, three or five minutes uh, to answer that. Maybe you will need l even less. Uh, the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian Minister of Defense, uh, you know him, a brave man, uh, he said that Ukraine has become a great testing ground for uh, NATO weapons. Well, still, we are still talking about old obsolete weapons. Some good or some absolutely not good. What is he talking about? I see. And I'm not going to ask about disrespect to his country to talk like this. And uh, what does he mean? <laughs> Which weapon is being tested in Ukraine? 
Well, well, remember earlier I talked about George Soros in the 1993 article that he wrote uh, that um, postulated a future where NATO would seek to align itself with Eastern European nations that would provide manpower that would be married to NATO technology. Now, when I read that, I was sickened, sickened, because it's the it, it represents the most callous approach to humanity possible. It, it basically says that the Ukrainian people, Ukrainian men, are commodities, uh, numbers. They're not humans. They're, they're, they're that. And I would have expected every Ukrainian alive to rise up and protest against that concept. Um, and yet we have the Minister of Defense endorsing it. Because what did he say? We're a testing ground. You give us the weapons, you take NATO technology, you marry it with Eastern European manpower, and then you test it. You test it. That means you don't know the outcome, you're just going to test it. And who's paying the price? Ukrainian manpower. He's saying he's willing to sacrifice the blood and guts of Ukrainian soldiers so that NATO can get a statistical outcome that improves the quality of their weaponry. This man should be arrested as a criminal. This man should be prosecuted as a war criminal. Ukrainians should revile his name. Um, and yet he continues to serve as the Minister of Defense of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, and sadly, he's not alone. I think the entire Ukrainian government operates in this, this way. Uh, you have a Ukrainian president who is desperately going around Europe shopping for more technology, for more newer weapons to bring into Ukraine to marry up with Eastern European manpower so that it can be sacrificed on the field of battle, not on the, not in the service of Ukraine, but to fulfill a U.S. and NATO-driven fantasy of bringing pain to Russia. Um, Zelensky isn't worthy of being the leader of Ukraine. Um, the, the, nobody in his government deserves to be in that position. Ukraine deserves so much better. They deserve leadership that uh, is looking out for the long-term welfare of the Ukrainian people, not the short-term political uh, gain of, you know, of, of, of a former comedian who, um, you know, allowed himself to be cast as Winston Churchill, but in reality is uh, just what he always was, a pathetic comedian um, acting in a play that he's not in control of. Major, thank you so much. And, uh, well, another 1,000 of thanks to you. My pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>